This conference, this conference like will to, now be. I'd like to read a brief uh, bio of Dr. Fawcett, uh, just to give you who don't know him a little background on who he is. Dr. Fawcett is an orthopedic sports medicine surgeon based in Washington, D.C., with the Centers for Advanced Orthopedics. His clinical practice focuses on complex knee and hip surgery. He is a team doctor for the George Washington University Athletic Department and numerous high schools, as well as a pool physician for the United States ski and snowboard teams. He has presented at numerous international meetings, published manuscripts and book chapters on the management of complex meniscus injuries. He serves on several committees with AOSSM and ISACOS, as well as directs the research efforts at the Centers for Advanced Orthopedics Research Foundation. Uh, we're honored to have Dr. Fawcett as our presenter. Um, as you have questions, please post them in the chat section. Um, at the end of the presentation, we'll go through those questions and have uh, dialogue and interchange with Dr. Fawcett. So Dr. Fawcett, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Marge, and thank you for that kind introduction. Thank you to all the attendees that are taking time out of their day to join us here. I uh, look forward to sharing some cases and kind of concepts about how to manage uh, cartilage and meniscus injuries in the knee. I look forward to answering any of your questions at the end of the talk as well. So I'll move forward. Here are my disclosures. Ulcerated cartilage is a troublesome problem, and once destroyed, it never repairs. This is an age-old problem from 1743, first cited by Dr. William Hunter. So we've been dealing with this problem for many years now, and we're just kind of continuing to build our technology and our concepts uh, to help improve our, treatment, our treatments and outcomes. So, you know, injury can, can occur at multiple levels. It can occur as a micro damage, which can be a, basically a blood trauma to the chondrocytes, may not result in any significant pain. Um, it can also be from uh, mechanical injury. Uh, it can be from a single load, such as a knee dislocation and uh, ligament injury, or it can be repetitive load from obesity. Um, the three phases are first the cartilage matrix damage, that then pr proceeds to chondrocyte apoptosis and then the loss of the proteoglycan and tissue function. We can also have osteochondral fracture, which we commonly see in patella instability and dislocation. You get this tri triphasic inflammatory immediately burst response. We also get a hematoma, as well as mesenchymal stem recruitment um, that can undergo, and even to undergo some uh, chondrocyte differentiation at the satellite site and within the site itself. Some of you may have noticed that if you wait a while before a, you try and replace that, sometimes they don't fit, both because the fragment grew and the defect filled in. And then lastly, osteochondritis dissecant, a problem in its own in which you know, the articular cartilage is normal, but the, osteo, the, the osteoid bone underneath it has created a delamination injury. The clinical evaluation, first looking at symptoms, are they having joint line pain? Do they have locking from an unstable fragment or cartilage flap? Take a look at their injury history. What have they tried so far? Have there been previous surgeries that have failed? Also understand their risk preference for whether they want a surgical treatment or non-surgical treatment and what their activity expectations are afterwards. We do a brief exam looking at the, whether or not they have an effusion, which can help in both the acute and chronic setting, uh, particularly if there's a hemarthrosis. Look at their range of motion. Is there an unstable fragment limiting their motion? And lastly, the meniscus, meniscal examination, having no meniscus is likely going to portend a continued problem for the cartilage. So we need to make sure they both have a completely functioning knee, uh, both ligament-wise, meniscal-wise, and cartilage-wise. And lastly, what is their BMI status? And then on a case-by-case, -case, uh, we want to rule out a subtle infection. Uh, there's a case I had who had an intraarticular chlamydial infection in a collegiate basketball player, continued to play through his effusions and basically denuded the entire patellofemoral joint in over a few months. Uh, we also want to look at review of their patient goals, what types of activities, what their risk aversion are for, for further surgeries, and then also review the rehabilitation required so that they're prepared in their decision. Radiographic evaluation is critical. Not only do we need to look specifically at the knee to rule out uh, moderate or severe grade osteoarthritis, we also want to get a magnification ball to get sizing wise, particularly if we're planning on doing any sort of transplant tissue. We want to get appropriate size. And then we also need to get an overall uh, understanding of the alignment of the knee. So we get a long-standing alignment on any cartilage or meniscus surgery just to make sure that we're not uh, going to be doing uh, a, a major surgery on a varus or valgus knee that may affect its outcome. 
And then we also want to get MRI sequences. T1 and T2 sequences are very helpful to both look at the chronic uh, as well as the severity of injury into the bone. We want to look at the adjacent cartilage. Is that normal? Look for associated meniscus tears. Is there osteophyte formation and whether there's subchondral edema or fragmentation, which will help to uh, tr um, drive treatment decisions. For our NR, also diagnostic arthroscopy can be very helpful, in particular for patients who have previously had surgery. Its advantages are it's quick, it's real time, it's easy, requires no general anesthesia, can be done under local. Um, we can also put probes in there to be able to palpate the cartilage and, and meniscus tissue disadvantages. We can't do any treatment. So at this stage, we're, it's not widespread to be doing chondroplasties or those uh, of that nature in the office, although some people are doing them at this stage. Um, and we need to use fluid uh, to examine the tissue, but now there is a probe available so you can palpate the, the cartilage and tissues. Surgical arthroscopy advantages are we can do some procedures. We can remove loose bodies. We can get a biopsy if you're going to do a chondrocyte transplant. We can probe the tissues. However, uh, it, it does take a little bit more logistics in terms of scheduling and often requires anesthesia. This is some of the views that we can get in in-office arthroscopy, fairly high resolution views. We can see that cartilage fissure right there. And when the patient bends his knee, you'll see the larger defect in the femoral condyle. Patients can relate to this. They can see it directly. You can share it with them. After you've done that, you can see that the full thickness defect right there and the associated meniscus. We can get pretty good measurements of the uh, cartilage uh, as well with the new probe. So our cartilage treatment options. My algorithm, I use this cutoff of 20 millimeters squared. And think of the pothole concept. So uh, if you have a smaller defect, they may not be as noticeable, and those typically don't need treatment. And if they do, a microfracture can do very uh, can be a, a very well suited option for these patients. In these larger defects, you can see the pothole will start to engage in the tibia once it's reached that area of curvature. These tend to be much more symptomatic to patients and often require larger types of surgeries, whether it be a, a Macy or osteochondral allograft transplant. It's also important to understand the subchondral bone quality, right? If it's just some edema or if they have osteochondritis dissecans or previous treatment of microfracture, this bone tissue may not be adequate enough just to do a simple uh, cartilage pasting procedure like an ACI. It may need uh, reconstruction of the subchondral bone, either through osteochondral allograft transplant or other types of transplant techniques. We also want to make sure we look at adjacent tissues, correct the alignment, as well as associate, uh, the associated meniscus and make sure that that's intact. So we'll go over a few cases at this point. This is a 28-year-old male, a physical PE teacher, uh, and so he's been having lateral-sided patellofemoral knee pain. Uh, he's an active volleyball player, plays in lots of leagues, but now is unable to jump or squat without severe pain. We have this MRI here that uh, shows relatively normal here. We'll go through these sequences. However, when we got to uh, arthroscopy, he had this large delamination cartilage flap that was engaging every time he brought his knee. We were not prepared at this time to do any cartilage transplantation. Um, so we performed a microfracture, augmented microfracture at this time. I think for a, a defect this size, I would probably recommend uh, staging this, but this is what we had at the time, so we offered it to them. But this is just as a case to show the microfracture does help. The lateral femoral condyle we unloaded with an unloader brace for uh, six months during his recovery uh, to help with his knee pain, and we protected him for eight weeks. And here is he's, uh, this is at his 18-month uh, appointment. He brought this video in uh, where he can now get back to dunking the ball and landing on that knee. So microfracture can be very good. It can be, uh, it can, it can recur, uh, get patients back to their activity level. Um, larger defects, uh, you gotta be more concerned about. And because of this large defect, I use this unloader brace to help protect that cartilage given the size. Uh, and this is a relatively uh, easy brace to use for patients. Um, and you can get a good result. In some cases, you may need to move on to bigger type uh, uh, graphs. So this is a 39-year-old female who's had some medial joint line pain. Um, it's been going on for years. She has pain with deep knee squatting. Um, she's had no previous trauma to her knee. This is her long-standing alignment. You can see she's in some amount of varus on that left knee. When we got these MRI sequences, we can see this cartilage defect in this area as well as associated meniscus damage and a root tear here. So this is the go sign that we see. And this is at uh, surgery. So uh, the 
meniscus has been totally ripped off of its root attachment that we're probing right now. We're uh, now preparing the uh, attachment zone of that root using a curette to get down the bone and mobilizing the meniscus. Once the meniscus has been mobilized, we, uh, in this case, it was still a little tight given its chronicity. Uh, we wanted to make sure that we get it to there without any tension. We're now drilling these uh, tunnels through the tibia, and this is called the tibial pull-through technique, where we pass these tunnels uh, through the intermedial uh, tibia. Once we pass the stitches uh, through the meniscus tissue, as we're doing here through this meniscal suture passer, this is done all endoscopically. We can then uh, bring these, these uh, sutures down through the tibia. We use this uh, monofilament guide coming up here to help bring these sutures back. The, the monofilament uh, retriever suture will bring these sutures down through the two tunnels. That was the first one. Here's the second one. A number of uh, sutures, uh, including both tape and uh, this, uh, this 2 0 suture here. We find that more sutures, the better. It helps uh, maintain stability. Uh, the failure point of this meniscus root tear is at the meniscus suture interface. So the more sutures you have, the better uh, stability you'll have in your knee. So we're bringing that down, and you can see we can reduce that meniscus tissue very nicely into its attachment point. However, this is very similar to a radial type tear. So we really do need to protect this tissue as well, because we do know that if there's any displacement in this tissue uh, at time zero before it's had a chance to heal, that that will not grow back. So for these patients, again, we use an unloader brace, we use a rebound cartilage brace to help protect the knee. Um, we start, just start with a double upright hinge brace for the first six weeks, uh, like a T-ROM brace, and then we move on to the un unloader brace. For the first six weeks, um, for week uh, six through 12, they're wearing it anytime they're up and about. Uh, walking, and then through weeks 12 to th through six months, uh, they wear with activities. Here's another case. This is a 26-year-old athletic trainer who had ACL reconstruction and medial meniscectomy done. She's still having frequent feelings of instability and pain along her joint line. In her diagnostic arthroscopy, she, she, uh, we see that there's complete defect of the uh, meniscal tissue right here, and she had normal alignment on x-rays. So she underwent a meniscal allograft transplant and, and revision ACL uh, reconstruction because the ACL was torn at the time. And here we have, uh, we can see the meniscal allograft transplant is placed right here. This is the markings right here. Um, and so for this patient, we've been able to restore her tissue. Again, we use that same rebound cartilage to protect the knee. Um, the brace is locked in extension. There are options, instead of using a T-ROM and moving to this rebound cartilage, you can get an attachment double upright uh, for the uh, other side. And then once you're ready to go into the unloading mode, you can remove that, that upright. So they go to a single upright um, unloader brace and use that. Um, we start with non-weight bearing for four weeks, and then we add a lot of them progressively weight bearing the brace and crutches from weeks five through eight. And this patient here, you know, this is a relatively higher BMI patient. And in this patient, the patient is in somewhat valgus. She's having lateral knee pain. She underwent a history, of, she underwent a chondroplasty two years prior to teaching to reaching me. She continues to have pain on the lateral joint line with any sort of impact activity, such as uh, you know, jogging, running, um, and it's inhibiting her, her weight loss program. She's not able to do any sort of exercise because of her knee pain. On this MRI, we can see here that uh, she has some cartilage defect over the lateral femoral condyle here. Let me go back, sorry about that. Over the lateral femoral condyle right here and here. And then on the sagittal views, you can see the cartilage defect right here. This is right in that midpoint and engagement zone. This kind of goes back to that concept of the uh, pothole. When that pothole engages, they start having some pain and discomfort. She underwent diagnostic arthroscopy, which shows a full thickness cartilage defect in this area, quite large defect. I don't think a microfracture would provide very much benefit for her in this large size. So uh, particularly given her alignment, we discussed surgical treatment options, which would be uh, doing a distal femoral osteotomy to correct her valgus, and then proceed with an osteochondral allograft transplant. Just some more focal views here. So here we are on her distal femoral osteotomy. We used a, a lateral approach to her knee, uh, performed that uh, procedure first, and just opened up her knee to basically get her back into neutral. And slightly, in this case, we got her slightly into a, a still neutral, but more varus than uh, valgus neutral. And then did an arthrotomy, 
can perform this osteochondral allograft transplant. We get great fit. It's very, it's, it's, you have to do very exquisite measurements to get these to be correct. But once they do, you've filled with normal cartilage, normal hyaline cartilage at time zero. That's the only technique that can provide normal hyaline cartilage at time zero. All the other ones have to uh, kind of build in a cartilage uh, matrix and or uh, build the cartilage cells. So these patients, we uh, protect them. Uh, we don't necessarily need to do as much unloading for her because we've done that through the distal femoral osteotomy. Uh, so this patient is just undergoing a, a, a double upright hinge brace to help protect the soft tissues and protect the knee range of motion for six weeks. She'd be non-weight pairing for a full two months um, to allow the osteotomy to heal and the osteochondral allograft transplant to heal. After that point, we progressively allow her to weight bear. The role of the uh, double of, of the uh, unloader brace can be uh, critical. And some of these patients who are waiting for a graft, um, or they have just a single onside arthritis, this can be helpful to get them uh, during their rehabilitation, the prehab, help with the range of motion, help with walking um, as they're waiting for their surgery. In particular, this may be at this point during the COVID-19 crisis, where we where a lot of tissue companies have hauled off. Uh, distributing grafts, and so patients are waiting. So this is a great alternative for patients during this period of time to help protect that uh, compartment disease, whether it be meniscus or cartilage, by using this unloader brace. Post-op, I, I already mentioned kind of the delayed phase integration as well as the early initial phase. You can add that, up, that other upright to give better stability and control in the knee, as well as lo lo lock the knee range of motion. Um, there's these inserts that you can put on either side to lock them uh, into 0, 20, 30, 60, 90 uh, degrees of motion um, that will help kind of uh, progress the range of motion and give you uh, the guided protection. And then the intermediate phase, when they return to start doing activities, it will continue to help protect the soft tissue and cartilage in that compartment by using this brace. That's how I use it for that, that uh, six week mark to six month mark, particularly in the meniscal radial tears and root tears. And then finally, if they do have some underlying cartilage damage um, that uh, you may want to protect or intermittently may have pain, you can always have them don't throw this brace away throw it back on in their final recovery. Um, and then they can use it as needed. If, you, if you're still concerned about that cartilage, we really can use this brace in a lifelong uh, protection and uh, don't necessarily need to rush to a knee replacement uh, par or partial knee replacement right away. So I wanted to make sure we had plenty of time for a question. So evaluating a patient with a cartilage injury requires a systematic approach with patient-specific counseling. So it really is going to depend on what their goals are, what their current pathology is, uh, and make sure you uh, investigate other sources of pathology or other opportunities that may not make the primary surgery very successful, including alignment, meniscus, and ligamentous stability. You also want to rule out and correct any malalignment to improve the odds of success. And last, and also you want to diagnose adjacent worrisome lesions, both with MRI and diagnostic arthroscopy. I really think that diagnostic arthroscopy plays a critical role in these patients pre-op because these are very expensive tissues if you're doing transplantation um, and you want to make sure that this is the, can be the right fit for the patient. For some of the less invasive transplant physicians, if you're just doing meniscus repair, it can also be helpful in terms of indicating surgery and whether or not they're a good candidate, as well as have it let you be prepared for what you may need to have when you do the surgery as well as the post-operative rehabilitation in terms of whether they may need bracing long-term. Patients with appropriate cartilage treatment can do very well with 75 to 100% uh, reaching midterm survivorship of upwards of 10 years. And unloading bracing can be a useful adjunct to allow earlier weight bearing protocols after their cartilage and meniscus surgeries. Thank you very much. I'd like to open up to any questions that we have here in the chat. Great, Dr. Fawcett, we have a couple questions. And please, um, attendees, uh, put your questions in there now if you haven't already. Uh, first question, what's the post-op management after microfracture treatment? So there's a couple things we want to do. The concept of microfracture is going to build a first stage is a superclot. So the first step of part we need to do is build a superclot. And it's important in microfracture you remove all that uh, calcified bone so that uh, the superclot has a good location to heal onto. Part of the superclot uh, formation is in that first few weeks, and we use CPM machine and or bike, uh, very low resistance or other leg push, other leg mo moving the, the knee, um, basically to help form that uh, that that superclot in the area of the defect. So CPM bike for those first six weeks, 
also, depending on the size, particularly if it's large, if you were to put pressure on that superclot, it's going to extrude out. So we need to limit their weight bearing using crutches. So it's non-weight bearing protocol for at least six weeks um, while working on range of motion. After that first six weeks, that fibrous uh, um, cartilage, hyaline-like cartilage uh, uh, tissue should be uh, resilient enough to be able to apply some pressure. I still think that in a large microfracture, like I discussed, putting them in an unloader brace will give that cartilage even better opportunity to heal appropriately. So then we start letting the weight bear and then progressively strengthen their weight. Uh, you know, I generally do not let them do any sort of significant impact activity for at least uh, six to eight months. We're like running, I'll wait for eight months. Uh, but if they want to do some low impact kind of plyometric exercises, we'll let them do start that. But running is just such a much more longer endurance uh, impact. Um, and then they should start to get their recovery around eight months. And this, so the outcomes are at around two years. Um, you know, in most cases, you can get 75% of patients out to two years. After two years, depending on their activity level, that may fall down. Great, thank you. Next question. How likely would you be to try to use these procedures versus total knee arthroplasty in an eligible patient over 50 years old? So that goes back to, that's a, a great question. That kind of goes back to patients' preferences. So um, for a lot of these uh, osteochondral allograft transplants, you know, it really goes back to what is the condition of the knee? Is this an early onset osteoarthritis patient where you have, you know, grade, grade two or three lesion on the tibia and a grade three or four lesion on the femur? That's likely more of an osteoarthritic uh, progression, and they may do well with just an osteotomy um, or a partial knee replacement. Osteotomy is not as favorable in the United States, has much more favor in our, in our North, uh, Canadian, North American partners and European uh, elsewhere, just because uh, the access to knee arthroplasty is a lot less and just a different approach to things, but certainly they can do very well with an osteotomy. It also depends on what their activity level are. Are, are these patients trying to get back to a low level activity, golf, tennis, or are these patients big runners, triathletes, those kinds of things? That may drive you to a more biologic osteotomy, osteochondral transplant than a total knee replacement or a partial knee replacement. But a partial knee replacement is a very successful uh, outcome. Um, and uh, we've done it, done it properly, can have very good outcomes. But in younger patients who are in their 20s and 30s, uh, that may not be an option. But in the 50-year-olds, certainly that is something to bring up to patients as an option. Hey, thank you. Next question, um, what percent of weight does the unloader brace unload? And um, uh, for this question, I'm going to also call on our uh, medical marketing director, Brett Carter, who is on, um, on the call. And um, we'll let Dr. Uh, Fawcett address that first and then hand it off to Brett. So imagine on a couple of things. First of all, imagine on the severity of deformity, right? So if we have a massively deformed knee, you know, if that weight bearing alignment's outside of the actual knee access, uh, it's going to be very hard for a brace to accommodate all of that. So that's the first concept. These are these are for you know relatively uh, small changes uh, in terms of unloading the knee. Um, but I'll give uh, let Brett answer the uh, more objective measurements. <laughs> okay, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, perfect. So um, what we're trying to do with, with the rebound cartilage is not to completely offload because uh, the cartilage is going to need some compression and some shear in order for it to thrive. So what we've what we've done is we've increased the unloading window if, uh, envelope, if you will. So we've got about 35, 40 degrees of range of motion that we transfer the load or we, we offload from one compartment to the to the other or more neutral. And what we found is that is about a 50% reduction from what we've achieved with our OA braces, um, or 50% increase. So we're we're offloading about 50% more than a standard unloading brace, which an unloading brace, all we're really concerned about is mid stance, so heel strike to toe off. That's all we need to offload. With the rebound cartilage, we actually need to, because of the anatomy and where the lesions are, as like you saw on Dr. Fawcett's um, surgical videos, oftentimes that's not going to be where we need to offload. And so we've increased the envelope, and then we've also increased the amount that we can offload. Great. Thanks, Brett. And stay on for this next question. Uh, first to you, Dr. Fawcett. How successful have you been in getting insurance coverage for both the post-op range of motion brace and the rebound cartilage brace. 
that's a great question. It's certainly going to vary uh, in terms of your relationship uh, with your insurance pr providers um, and your location. Uh, so we have not had that much of an issue. Um, we usually run DME benefits um, prior to any surgery because we know that we're going to be providing all sorts of DME, CPM, cryotherapy, bracing, and crutches. So we get an overall understanding of what's covered for the patient, what's not covered. Um, and then that may drive us towards the one single brace uh, using the upright on there versus going from a traditional post-op brace to a motor brace. But uh, typically we found that if you advocate for this uh, to talk about the pathology that's involved and what your goals of therapy, um, that that typically uh, is acceptable for insurance companies to provide at least coverage of it. And then depending on what the DME benefits are, that may make drive a decision for the patient. Great, thanks. And Brett, some comments on reimbursement. Sure. So technically, those are two billing events. So like Dr. Fawcett mentioned, you, you want to talk about the entirety of the, the treatment approach, but the the billing codes are separate and apart. So usually there is no issue, just like uh, Dr. Fawcett mentioned. There are situations where you will want to use the dual upright for a, a short period of time to immobilize or limit the range of motion and then remove that hinge. We do offer that benefit for the instances where the insurance coverage is not, not so good or they won't cover the two different charges. You're able to accommodate the immobilization and the offloading, continue that through the eight to 12 months that you would need to with one brace. So we have a couple of different options, but by and large, the post-op braces or immobilizers will use a separate code and uh, then your your DME policy will, will take place. And then the um, single upright knee brace code is appropriate for the rebound cartilage. Great, thanks, Britt. Uh, Dr. Fawcett, another question for you. Um, share your thoughts on the use of heel wedges and education of the patient on optimal individualized footwear types to promote offloading of medial or lateral knee joint surface as another way to optimize the surgical outcome. That's a great point. And I use this most often in ski boots. I have a lot of skiers in my patients. And uh, this type of brace is just not as uh, basically, not, it's harder to use during skiing just because of the size of some of these boots. Um, and, and particularly the lateral side can be difficult. So I use a lot of foot uh, wedges and orthotics uh, for my skiers. Um, so we can try and they can still be in a neutral position uh, and be able to kind of put edges up, get edge on and edge off appropriately without putting a lot of pressure through an arthritic compartment. Um, so it can be very helpful for patients. Um, I, mean, I find that most patients don't want to change their orthotics uh, between, and they may have a various number of shoes. So uh, on one side of the brace, you put it on, it's on your knee. And so whether you're going to work, you're going to go work out, or you're going to go out with friends, you can still wear the brace, uh, whereas the orthotic may not fit in all those shoes. So uh, it can be helpful in a more long-term uh, prospect. If patient, patients don't want to wear the brace, they can have that as another option. Um, we basically get a foot mold, and then we tell the orthotist, you know, we want to put a, a post or a lift in a certain compartment, uh, and that can be helpful for patients. Also, patients have difficult with compliance of bracing, the, uh, of, uh, adjusting at the foot level can be helpful. Again, it's not going to affect large degrees of uh, deformity at the knee, but may give you about 10 to 20 degrees change uh, to get you in that neutral position. Great, thank you, Dr. Fawcett. Other questions, please enter them in, um, in the chat area. There's one here. Another one? Oh, sorry. Um, do, you prefer, do you prefer to use the off-the-shelf sizing or custom options for the rebound brace? For our rebound brace, we use off-the-shelf. Um, it, it is, it is uh, swappable. Um, so, you know, the right medial you can use for the left lateral. Uh, so you can sw swap them around so you don't have to have a massive inventory. Um, but... Uh, so that, that is an option for patients, uh, but uh, we, and then in some cases um, with the knee is, you know, very big or very small, uh, we'll use the custom sizes. Great, thanks. Um, go ahead, I interrupted you, Dr. Fawcett, with some other thoughts you had. Oh, no, I was gonna read this chat question. I've got it running on my window here too. Okay.
you know, I think that uh, the crutch, the, the the braces themselves, um, you know, can be very helpful. Uh, we we often may provide these patients uh, prior pre-op to kind of try out these braces and see how it feels. Um, it can also help in terms of understanding what their knee outcome should be like when you've unloaded it. Uh, and and so they, they do enjoy wearing the, getting a sense of kind of where their knee can be and the, and uh, it's. It's, uh, I would say it's a little bit more complex than the OA braces uh, in terms of it's on and off. So if you're having an older patient uh, who has OA, uh, using the OA brace is probably better off than having just one brace for all these patients. Uh, there's another question that was just posted that feels a little incomplete, but you see it. Um, until what size can try the microfracture? I'm not sure that was a clear question. I think I understand what he's saying. So what size, up to what size defect would you use a microfracture? Uh, again, it goes to that two centimeter uh, squared area, um, which is not a very big area at all, um, but I, I prefer smaller is better. Um, so we do pretty, that's why I feel like the diagnostic is also be very helpful and better, better understanding of the size of the defect than uh, an MRI, particularly if the MRI is not 3T. Uh, have those cartilage sequences are not as uh, you know stand out. If they don't stand out as well. Uh, it can be harder to diagnose, particularly if there's no underlying bony edema. So two centimeters squared is my recommendation for a microfracture. Uh, going above that, uh, you have other options that we talked about: the Macy uh, autograft, uh, osteochondral autograft transplants, and then the allograft. Would you use uh, Would you use this for AVN? So again, that goes to go back to the status of the subchondral bone, which is really important um, because uh, for microfracture, uh, you, you know there's not a very good blood flow in that area, right? So those patients with AVN, uh, I'm assuming that, that we're not talking about microfracture. Then the question is about bracing. Is that what you said? I don't know. It's not the same person, right? Different person? A different person. Uh, okay. The question. All right, yeah. So yes, you can use it for AVN. Um, if AVN is a unicompartmental, um, sometimes the AVN can extend over both condyles. Uh, but I would say that uh, be careful with AVN because a number of cases of AVN um, are actually meniscus root tears. So if you see AVN on MRI um, or, or sunk, take a really good look at that medial meniscus root because off, more often than not, that is the, the cause of the primary etiology. And repairing that, you can actually restore the knee if you get there sooner. So uh, take a very close look at that medial meniscus root. Make sure that there is no ghost sign. Uh, but if uh, you're, but if I do see that and I do see this subchondral edema, uh, then we will put them in an unloader brace until the time of surgery, uh, which point we'll repair the meniscus root and they'll use that brace post time. Great. Any role of braces in OA with barus knee? Yes, very much so. I mean, I think that the, these can help quite a bit if they're in some amount of varus. Um, uh, this is some of the more resilient braces uh, for that type of tech, for that type of kind of offloading. Um, either the OA brace or this brace. Um, as Brett mentioned, this has a little bit more increase in uh, offloading than the OA braces. Um, but again, if it's a markedly varus knee, right? If if, it, if the alignment goes way outside of the knee joint, uh, that's going to be probably better off taken care of uh, surgically, either with an osteotomy or knee replacement. Um, this next one I'll have Brett comment on also. Please clarify the differences between the rebound cartilage and the general OA unloader braces as to their unloading qualities and their um, indications. Okay, sure. So what the, the braces do look very similar, the rebound cartilage and the the unloader one knee brace and downloader one definitely was predicate device but the rebound cartilage was modified in several ways to optimize it for the cartilage repair patient so oa as i mentioned earlier all we're looking for is mid stance to transfer the load and then relax when you're in sweet swing phase so offload when you're bearing weight and then relax so you don't put those strains or stresses on the knee joint when you're in swing phase sitting anything like that where you don't need to to offload. The differences in the rebound cartilage is one, you don't have the pain that you would have with OA mid stance. It's usually a younger patient profile. 
So the demands of the brace itself are different just from a patient expectation perspective. So what we did with the rebound cartilage is with increasing the envelope that we offload, we also made some changes to the length of the brace. We shortened it up. We took some, um, some of the shell, the rigidity in the shell, we made it a little more pliable so we can activate your dynamic stabilizers. We don't want any quad inhibition or hamstring inhibition. So you've got the, the shells have a little more flexibility to it. And we've also, we increased, we included a, a sleeve to increase the proprioceptive response for this younger, more active, more demanding patient. So it is a little bit more brace for this patient by design to optimize it. So we tried to take all the different factors that we would need with a cartilage repair, whether it be a microfracture or more of a transplant or, cell, uh, transplant or cellular based treatment to offload this cartilage for the long term. Uh, we want to protect that cartilage overload until it fully matures. And, and you know, with some of the cellular based procedures, that's 18 to 24 months during their activity level. It's gr great. Thank you, Brett. Um, any other questions? Um, here is one more. Um, knee with subchondral edema with arthritis. How do you manage that? So uh, there's a number. First, if it's unicompartmental, I definitely will try an OA brace, um, and we'll try open that up. In a young patient, uh, isolated compartment. I'm talking young is like less than 40. I'll certainly discuss the options of osteotomy with the patients. Um, if they're older than uh, 40, then we will also discuss the benefits of partial knee replacement with the patients. But we usually typically try and start off with unloader bracing in that conservative treatment phase, um, and then compound that with, you know, whether it's injections with cortisone, viscous supplementation, biologics, uh, just to see how long they can go while protecting the subchondral bone with the OA light. With OA, the OA, the X, this is new X one, right? New X brace. Unloader one X, yeah. Unloader one X, yes. Uh, Brett, do you want to uh, talk about that just briefly? Sure. So um, in the progression of knee bracing and uh, technology with osteoarthritis, we've uh, optimized our unloader brace line with the addition of a, a, another unloading brace, very similar to the single upright dynamic unloading action that we have with um, our other braces, but what we really tried to pay attention to in this, this instance was patient compliance, patient comfort, and ease of use for these patients. Uh, some, they have dexterity issues, some are older, um, some have a lot of soft, fleshy tissue or redundant tissue. So we've tried to optimize this, the new brace using all of the same offloading principles and that dynamic action, which has been proven clinically time and time again, but make it to where it's easier for the patient to, to don and doff, easier for the patient to um, manipulate if they need to while they're wearing it, and easier uh, technically for the practitioners to make sure that they can fit and the patient can replicate that fit once they leave the office. So we just tried to fine tune and really pay attention to the customer experience along with the offloading capabilities. There's no sacrifice to the offloading with the new model, it just is optimized for the, uh, like a deluxe edition for the uh, treatment of OA. Great, and here's another one, Brett, that I think you can handle. Uh, how is the extra offloading achieved in the rebound unloader cartilage brace? That's a great question. Um, so what we did is we added elasticity, about four inches of elasticity to each one of the straps. So the dynamic nature of the offloading in any of the braces is, is in the straps, the magic is in the straps. If we didn't allow that elasticity, we would have been limiting range of motion. Patients would not have been able to go get all the way to full extension, which we did not want to do that. So in order to offload during that last portion of swing phase and allow full extension, we added some elasticity to those straps. That's how we can offload and allow full extension. Great, excellent question, yes. 
Um, any other questions? I think there's a question about patellofemoral arthritis. Is there any brace for patellofemoral joint arthritis? That's a very difficult uh, joint to take care of. If it's unicompartmental, uh, you know, particularly off the medial side, um, you, you can get some of these, uh, you know, kind of braces that help try and push it over. You can you try a patellar stability brace. Um, I find that uh, just even some KT taping, uh, reverse McConnell taping can be helpful. Um, and then if it's a lateral side, you know, you've tried the McConnell taping or the other instability brace uh, with the donut pushing the knee that way. Uh, but it's very hard to uh, manage patellofemoral arthritis with a brace. Marge, I wanted to mention one one other thing that Dr. Fawcett had mentioned uh, or touched on earlier was the alignment issue, and I think that often gets overlooked with the benefit of the the unloader braces is helping with that alignment either pre-op to let the patient feel are they what they'll feel like if they have a more neutral aligned knee, but also on those borderline patients, if you even if you're doing an osteochondral allograft and they have a little bit of misalignment, but not enough to do an osteotomy. It's a really fantastic tool. We've had some great success in keeping those patients, even the cartilage doesn't need to heal, but the alignment needs to be addressed, especially as that bone's integrating into the host. And this, the rebound cartilage will allow them to correct that misalignment, especially if it's slight, and then still allow the active aggressive rehab with that optimizing the healing environment. So that, I think that's something that uh, we should always keep in the tool belt is that alignment issue that just isn't bad enough to treat surgically, but still if we leave it untreated, there's a high uh, probability that we're gonna have the same problem a few years down the road. Yeah, I agree, Brad. I had a great case that illustrated that. Uh, this patient had just some she was, you know, not even quite varus. Her alignment was going right uh, through the tibial, medial tibial spine. Uh, we did osteochondral allograft transplant. She did well for the first two months um, and then started kind of getting back to her activities. Um, she went back running a little faster than I would have allowed her to do. Um, she kind of got out of the rehab position, just doing her own thing. She started having a lot of pain. When I came back, she started showing a fair amount of edema in the, in the, uh, in the area where we had done the graft. We put her on loader brace, her pain resolved. We kept her on loader brace for three months. Um, repeat the MRI, everything was gone at that point. It healed up and she was able to get her running, started running back around uh, eight months. Uh, so I agree, totally agree with that. That's a great case. I gotta include that case in here as well. Excellent, excellent. I don't see any other additional questions in the chat section. I'll give, uh, give you all another minute to put any additional ones in. Okay, then if not, um, I believe we've concluded the program. Thank you again, Dr. Fawcett. Um, each of you will be receiving a follow-up email with some links to some of the information that Dr. Fawcett shared today. And we appreciate um, any questions you have please follow up um, via those emails. Thank you for participating. Uh, thanks for being uh, big champions of this new way of sharing information. And Dr. Fawcett, thank you for all of your expertise. Uh, we'll end the program and uh, have a great rest of your day. Thank you, Marge. Thanks, Dr. Fawcett. All right, thank you, Brett. Take care.